What's up, everybody? This is Brady Grove bringing you a very special interlude episode of Roto Bowler's official MMA podcast. Tap that. By the way, you can follow me on Twitter at Roto Brady. Uh, the my you have this will be coming out on Monday, but we have UFC picks uh, episodes every week. Check out my XFL and USFL gambling content and the YouTube page and Facebook page. Just getting started, starting to upload content onto there. And with me today, you know I am a huge fan of the four podcasts that this guy does for the Sports Gambling Podcast Network, host of the College Basketball Experience, the College Football Experience, the XFL Gambling Podcast, and USFL Gambling Podcast. Give it up for Colby. Dan, Colby, how you doing today, man? So glad to have you here. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. I'm always excited to talk sports, uh, no matter, you know, whatever sport it is. I mean, especially the ones that I cover that I'm a little more knowledgeable in. Well, so this has been such a fun time to follow alternative football in general. You know, the ELF is a lot more prominent now uh, in the in the talent that they're able to export and import. Uh, the National Arena League and the Albany Empire, they've been super fun to watch. And it, I think that the XFL season, it got off a bit rocky, uh, and especially when those ratings tanked in the middle of the season. But they've made a real comeback. And I thought the quality of league play really improved over the latter half of the season. Yeah, I would agree that, you know, and that that's only going to happen with time, I think. For, for whatever reason, you have a lot of the, you know, over the, the course of my lifetime, at least, you have a lot of people that want to see these leagues fail. And I, I've never understood it, but they, they'll quick to, to, you know, make jokes about, you know, the offense or the defense or the quality of play when really these are there's no continuity there. Even in college, even in high school, you have continuity uh, so I think as you're seeing with the USFL and in, in year two, uh, this will only continue to get better in the XFL or the USFL or, or, you know, depending on the league, whatever, whatever the league, the more time you spend together, just like anything else in life, the better you're going to become. The product will be better. And at this point in the world of amateur and professional athletics, I think you could argue that high school might have the most continuity of any level. Yeah. Well, D maybe D three college football, <laughs> something <laughs> like that, but yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but in general though, you still take like, if we were to just grab, like, I don't know if you were supposed to, if you were to grab like Kansas's football roster, there's still probably like 50 guys that were on that team last year, maybe 40 guys. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that's an advantage to the quality of play you're going to see. Well, and that comes down to, you know, the coaching choices by, you know, a, a program collegiate or professional. And I think that's what these spring leagues have often struggled to reach is, you know, having the, and that's why it's been so refreshing to see a guy like Reggie Barlow, who has just done fantastic for the DC defenders. And, you know, it's these guys that the bigger name coaches, are not in it as seriously, it's always seemed like, as the guys like Reggie Barlow, who have succeeded at a lower level of college football. And, you know, to your point about people rooting for these spring leagues to fail, for whatever reason, man, I, I think it's because, pe like, NFL fans can be weirdly the most pretentious um, about, or at least a little bit more closed-minded. No, I completely agree. To me, the NFL, well, the NFL, like, fans grab the, the, the 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 fan that I don't even think is a fan of football. They say they're a fan of football, but they're not a fan of football, in my opinion. They they don't know anything about the history or 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 you know, they don't appreciate certain things. They they just play fantasy football in an office pool or something, you know, and and you know, now the NFL still has the hard some hardcore fans too, but I think they do a great job of appealing to uh, you know, the people that really don't know. I mean, I'm I'm down here in South America. I was at a party on Saturday where, uh, you know, uh, I met some Colombian people that asked me, uh, do I like the NFL? And I was like, do you watch the NFL? And they said, yeah, only, but only the playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So. Well, that, that is weird. And you know, it's the XFL and USFL fans, man, they root for each other's leagues to fail. When I don't understand how you're not just a spring or alternative football fan or a football fan in general, you know, and that's why the NFL is able to be, 
so globally successful and so successful in this country is because they can reach those people. But it's really impossible to follow a season of spring football and not be a fan of the sport of football. Um, and, you know, that's why there's such a limited group. It's such a niche market. But even now, I think we're seeing the amount of media coverage in, you know, formats like this explode in terms of the USFL and XFL. Yeah. And, you know, I find the irony of that once again, like even your hardcore NFL fans that will belittle the USFL or the CFL or the uh, XFL, um, they don't even know their own history. The NFL struggled for decades. The NFL didn't have anyone showing up to their games for decades. So I find it hilarious that they can hop on the trend when it's super popular, but they'll be the first to, to diss it when their own product that they love for, for 40 years, you know, uh, maybe even longer uh, for certain franchises really struggled. So uh, it's just hilarious to me, but yeah, I don't understand it because if you're a football fan to me, it doesn't matter. I've always said this. I can watch a high school game. I can watch a D three game. I can watch a USFL game. I can watch, you know, uh, even the CFL, which has different rules and XFL, you know, their kickoff different rules. I can still appreciate the football that's being played. I don't always agree with the rules, but uh, and and what's not to like about people, you know, I, I I've done stand up comedy for twenty years, so I I can resonate with people that try that are trying to find their way to success, and I don't understand why anyone would ever root against that because I think it's awesome that you know this guy was working at a gas station and then he's he's still not giving up on his dream, and you've seen it happen, Kurt. Well, they made a movie about it, Kurt Warner, American Underdog. <laughs> I never I never saw the movie, but. But my point is, is that he really was working as a gro at a grocery store when he was playing for the Iowa Barnstormers or whatever. So like, and and it's funny they'll make that a movie. Oh, what a great story! And it's like, but here you get to tune in every Saturday or Sunday, and you know a lot of uh, NFL fans will belittle it, and it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, I mean, you want a good story? Take a look at the career of McLeod Bethel Thompson. You know, and that's a that's a real dude. And it's not Zachary Levi, you know, suiting up and playing him like that's unfolding every single week in the USFL. And, you know, to the thing about why it it's always been so hard for the spring leagues to gain credibility, even though it's the problems with the NFL game and their own stubbornness as to how they marketed themselves that created the desire for spring football in the first place. But it shows me that one, you know, this is a different era. This is an era where we can watch every FCS game on a network's streaming app or on ESPN Plus. Any game, I can watch every college baseball game every week because that's yeah. it. And the idea of that even 10 years ago was absolutely insane. So guys know who guys like Ben DiNucci are coming out of college. Uh, and, you know, they know the like Akil Glass. People know who Akil Glass is when he signs with the New Orleans Breakers. And the other thing it always shows me, and this occurred to me when I was uh, listening to you guys talk about college basketball players, whether they're staying or going pro and what opportunities they have, it's that scouting is nonsense, man. They're just guessing. Professional scouts in the major leagues are just guessing based on boxes that they're checking and very stand And you see it through the results of the draft. And they'll look back and say, well, obviously, Giannis Antetokounmpo should have been the number one pick. And it's like, we all were pretty sure that he should have gone 14th that year. Like, the, the scouting is nonsense, man. And so you get tight ends like Jay Sternberger in the USFL or guys like, uh, like Sage Surratt who are just bawling out. And before, nobody ever would have thought that that was in their wheelhouse. And now people are changing their tune. Yeah, and, and I mean, we have a long history of seeing that. I mentioned Kurt Warner. I mean no matter what you want to say about these spring leagues, clearly scouting has not been good. I feel like football is a comp is such a complex game. It's even harder than basketball as far as your scouting. And I think they miss so often that uh, you have, you should want three or four leagues because you know, for a while there, we didn't have a spring league and, and besides the CFL. And I bet we've lost a lot of talent that that, you know, could have been very good. We saw Cavante Turpin last year in the, with the New Jersey Generals make the Pro Bowl in year one. We saw Mo Alexander, Maurice Alexander have a touchdown kick return for the Detroit Lions. He was a part of the Philadelphia Stars last year. You can go on and on. I mean, I would argue the naysayers. I, I can. I mean, how many Doug Williams, Joe Theismann, uh, you know, you can go on and on and on about Doug Flutie. 
Uh, and those are just quarterbacks, Jake Delhome, Brad Johnson, guys that have played in Super Bowls, started in Super Bowls, won Super Bowls. Um, it just it's it's a it's a stupid argument. They don't know the sport, in my opinion. And and to you know, what works for one coach might not work for another coach, you know, and and vice versa. So if that fifty fourth man gets cut uh, on you know the New Orleans Saints, and you know he just doesn't find the right coach you know, before his dream would die unless the CFL would, would grab him. And then, you know, he's got to ask his, you know, his family, do we want to go live in Canada? There's uh, taxes are insane. I mean, there's a lot of variables here that, that go into it, but, you know, uh, but finding, if he can find the spring league in America and the XFL or, or USFL, CFL, ELF, the more opportunities, the better arena football, whatever. Um, then you'll have more of a chance to maybe that right coach will see you. And, and, you know, another thing is you can keep improving life is not written today. You know what I mean? So uh, wh whether, you know, there's plenty of college football players that might've started late in high school or they were playing at the wrong position, you know? So there's plenty of scenarios. It doesn't make a lot of sense to bash it in my opinion, but those, like I said, I, I don't believe those people truly love football. They're just kind of there for the, the, fantasy football office party or stuff like that, you know? Do you happen to remember a dude named Zeke Pike who signed with Auburn, like, uh, back in the 2010, who was supposed to be the heir apparent to Cam Newton, got kicked yeah. out of school for a DUI and three other schools. Um, he went to my high school, and he was, like, there while I was there, and we were people were like, dude, he's ranked in the top 150 on ESPN's top recruits, and I'm like, dude, what are they watching? I was like, I... Dude, he he led a a Kentucky high school team to their district semifinals and had a one to one touchdown to interception ratio. What is the criteria? These people aren't watching the sports that they're talking about. Yeah, and, and I mean, some of that is system and coaching, but some of it is just yeah. I, I agree that you know, and I've I actually personally have met a couple uh, player people that have worked with player development or you know uh, on the general management side of things. And I don't want to say all of them, but some of them, I do question how much they know the sport. So, you know, there's that. But I don't know. I mean, uh, you're right. And you saw, I remember Dan Kendra was like the top recruit in the nation out of the state of New Jersey. He went to Florida State. I mean, he ended up playing fullback, I think, if memory serves me correct. But he was originally a quarterback, but he never made the, the pros, and they whiffed on him. And I mean, you really see them whiff a lot on quarterback, more so than any position, but. But in general, you see it that all the happens time. happens when you just pick the, the top 25 most handsome dudes coming out of the state of California that year. <laughs> right. We don't, that'll make up the Heisman race. Who is the most handsome dude who also plays for a big-name school that's doing okay this year? Right. Uh, so let's, let's talk a little bit more specifically about what's happened in the XFL and what's going on. Uh, th this will be a few days past now. Um, but Jordan Tamu was named the XFL Offensive Player of the Year, which, oh, that's tough. And I think well-deserving. I think there's a handful of dudes that deserve that. Uh, but, you know, the, they really, for the first half of the season, thrived on the play of Abram Smith. And now Tamu's passing a lot better, uh, and the receiving core has become much more prominent. But the, the kind of fading of Abram Smith over the latter half of the season has me a little bit concerned about them going up against this renegades defense that has been able to cause a lot of turnovers on the season. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the renegades, whether, you know, <laughs> I, I mean, however they got Luis Perez, however they got <laughs> big Bolton and Kelly Bryant, I think that offense is only starting to improve than the fact they got a two week wait. Uh, for before the championship game, I think only strengthens their their you know uh ch they're 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 gonna spend more time together and, and that only strengthens their chances at winning um the the championship game. And you're right. And but uh, Abram Smith, that been going back to our conversation before, this is a guy that played linebacker most of his college career. This is my point exactly. He what I think his senior year he ends up playing running back at Baylor. Now he's he's you know he led the uh, XFL in rushing. So he's still learning the position. He's still learning the position. You know what I mean? So uh, that it's great to see. But yeah, I am a bit concerned that they kind of have gone away from him uh, down the stretch 
as the as the passing game has opened up. But once again, it's been a great story to see Jordan Tamu, who, you know, an XFL 2.0, uh, really stood out as one of the better quarterbacks with the St. Louis Battlehawks. And then last year with the Tampa Bay Bandits in the USFL, he really struggled. But I don't think that was his fault. And it's funny how many people thought he was terrible. It's like uh, the offensive line of the Tampa Bay Bandits was terrible. They couldn't run the football, so they just keyed in on him. And uh, you see what coaching coaching matters. It, you know, you can be a very good quarterback and behind a bad offensive line, and people will never know that you're a good quarterback. And, you know, that is what we're seeing with the Philadelphia Stars right now. Of all things, man, I picked them as by far the best value for preseason future to win the championship at, what, plus 550? It seemed like an incredible value for the full coaching continuity that they were going to have and in case Cook. The, the fact that they were, you know, good on defense last year, not great, but good. And now it's just through a weak offensive line, they've been crumbling. And it's what we saw, uh, and it's why I don't want to judge Kyle Sloter too much for how the first half of the renegade season went because he was getting rushed and crushed every single time. True. True. And Sloter has got a little Brett Favre in him where, you know, he'll take, even when he's protected, he'll take a lot of gambles, but I do think he's better than what we saw uh, in the XFL this year. And I, 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 I was perplexed when the USFL, you know, when, when the Michigan Panthers trotted out Josh Love and, uh, you know, the Memphis Showboats trotted out uh, Brady White and Pittsburgh, you know, whoever they trotted out because they switch every all the time. But now it's Troy Williams. I was perplexed that they didn't, you know, go out and try to get Kyle Slaughter because it's a veteran and, and with some with the correct coaching. Uh, I think you can win with Kyle Slaughter. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't write him off if I were you, but you make a great point. And, and uh, yeah, the O-line, it matters. It matters. I mean, not to just service hot takes out left and right, you know, but Tom Brady's an amazing quarterback, but I also believe he's a little overrated by our society because of he got to play in the same system with a lot of Hall of Famers around him. I still think he's a great quarterback. He's a Hall of Fame quarterback. He deserves all that. But I do think we rushed to, to uh, say, well, he's the best quarterback ever. I, I would disagree. But um, that that's the benefit of being in a, in a system for so long, surrounded by a lot of great talent. And, and obviously, he was very talented himself. So, you know, situation matters. And it's why arguments like LeBron James versus Michael Jordan are so stupid is because like, dude, there is no comparison between people who played in the NBA in the eighties and nineties and a dude who played in the two thousands to now there's no comparison because it's almost an entirely different game. And that's neither of those guys fault, but it does make a comparison stupid, but it's also a polarizing comparison. So every morning on ESPN, you're Who's the best of all time, LeBron James or Michael Jordan. And it's, it's things like that. It is impossible um, to compare. And, you know, like Brady White, he reminds me a little bit about of Paxton Lynch and just like what his ceiling and floor is. And maybe that's just the kind of breed that the Memphis Tigers were churning out a quarterback at the time. Uh, but interesting that they kind of look a little bit resurgent with Cole Kelly, a quarterback. Yeah, Cole Kelly uh, showing some signs of life, even with his legs, because he's a big, he's a big quarterback. Um, I like to say there are lawn chairs, but he got a rushing touchdown the other day, and they found a win. I, I personally am reluctant to buy into uh, them really improving for the season and like making a playoff run, but they certainly look a lot better with Cole Kelly than they do with Brady White. I'll give you that. And if you could explain to my listeners real quick what a lawn chair is to you. Well, you know, the, the, the game of football has shifted over decades. In my opinion, you know, if you go back to the original football and, uh, you know, in its creation, college football created football back in the late 1860s. But then after that, you know, your progression, even in the national football league, Sammy ball was a quarterback that also played safety, led the league in interceptions as far as from a defensive back standpoint, not throwing. Right. So the, Somehow in like, to me, the, I'd say the 1980s kind of started it. Maybe the late 1970s, you started to see this trend of guys that uh, were not very athletic that would be able to play quarterback. Right. And they kind of, in my opinion, and we, we came up with the term lawn chair just because 
they they kind of and the rules started to protect the quarterback, and you started to see a player that really, in my opinion, I don't really consider a football player. Uh, I I posted this thing of uh, and and I know I'll get flack for this, but I remember the NFC Championship uh, three years ago, I think it was maybe four, Packers. Buccaneers, Aaron Rodgers has a chance to to go to the Super Bowl if he runs like a seven yard run. <laughs> He's wide open, like everyone on the. Uh, so he goes to throw a pass. He buys some time because he is actually a little more athletic than your traditional lawn chair, and uh, the, all the receivers kind of go to the left part of the field, and he has a clear chance to run seven yards for a touchdown. Now he might have to pull a John Elway or something, and. and and, you know, make some physical contact, but he eludes all that. And he just throws a crazy pass. The game's over. And it drives me crazy to sit there and say, you know, to see the evolution of the quarterback. That's just one play that stands out in my mind, but you get people, you know, like Phil, if, like to me, Mark Rippon was one that uh, played for the Redskins in the early nineties. And man, that guy did not have business playing football in my opinion, but th- th- you see this over and over. So I consider them lawn chairs, They're just big, players that are protected by rules that would never be on a football field for any other reason, in my opinion. And, you know, it seems like, I mean, to me, Eli Manning, Peyton Manning, lawn chairs, very good at passing, but you know, I, I I actually in the office of SGPN, I made a tape of uh, when, when Peyton throws an interception, how many times he doesn't try to make a tackle. Right. And to me, I'm like, so what is your purpose? You're not a football player. You're just a guy there to throw the ball around. You know what I mean? You're very good at it. You're very good at it. But, you know, we've we've made this sport to this point where you don't need to really be a football player, you know, and it, it, it bothers me sometimes. <laughs> it bothers me because I just think, come on, you go to play the game. There's a set of rules in the game. Go out there and try to make the fucking tackle. You know what I mean? If you throw the interception or you fumble the ball or your wide receiver fumbles the ball and you're there, go make the tackle. You're on the football field. But no, you know, I feel like we have a pandemic of – of uh, quarterbacks that just are there for, like you said, for their good looks. And uh, you know, they do, they can, Hey, they, they're very efficient passers. But to me, I hate it when, uh, when the other realm of football comes involved with it and they, they elect not to play essentially. And, you know, to that point, you're a very uh, loud proponent of the triple option and, you know, across college football, pro football, I'm sure even in high school, because we saw it in high school basketball when Steph Curry and the Golden State Warriors style of play rose to prominence. But it's like all these sports at these high levels, you know that they're run by hacks for the most part because they're all just copycatting. They're all just, oh, they have a good quarterback and a run in an air raid. That's what we're going to do. And it's like, but you can't do it as well as them, man. The, the, the Where you come up with advantages is not doing the same thing everybody else is doing worse. You got to find what you're better at and try to use that to your advantage. And that's why we see teams like Air Force, Army, being able to consistently win running like three plays and we've seen variations on that. And that's why I love coastal Carolina's variation on offense is because that is something different. And it, it's, it, it helps to neutralize, you know, certain gaps, but it's something different that teams have to prepare for and take seriously. Yeah. And, and unfortunately we are in the minority somehow, or the people that are in charge, you know, i worry about the game. Um, the game like college football. One of the reasons why I always preferred college football to any other really style of football is because you would see the variance to me. You could see innovation at its first, uh, its first stop. You know, you would see triple option teams against the air raid run and shoot teams. I remember watching, you know, air force take on, uh, I think it was David Klingler in Houston back in the early nineties when those were the run and shoot was, you you weren't supposed to do that in football. And then, you know, triple option, I, I would still say, and I know uh, I was, you know, friends with the great late Mike Leach, you know, he designed the air raid after the triple option. So, and I don't know if you noticed this, but uh, recently they have outlawed uh, the cut blocks. So Army is no longer going to be running the triple option this year. And I'm curious to see if Navy and Air Force, so Army's going to be running out of the gun, some of that coastal Carolina stuff. But I think that's terrible for the sport because, they don't have any they don't have any proof they say it's more dangerous and i agree paul johnson lobbies uh for this saying it's the same as tackling somebody and i i completely agree 
I completely agree. It's like the kickoff thing. I don't believe in their, they, they never can show me a number. And if they really cared about player safety, then we wouldn't be playing all these games on artificial grass and in domes where you can really get hurt. You know what I mean? I can actually provide the data on that. I think this is a money grab. I think they want, and unfortunately we're leaving college football up to, to television execs and television execs want more of passing. They think more scoring and more passing leads to more ratings, which maybe it does. I, you know, I, I understand that I'm in the minority that really loves football. And there's other people that if you want to make your game as popular as ever, you need to get the lay fan that really knows nothing about the sport. And maybe, maybe that's the best thing for your product to make money. But I, I think to me, the beauty of why I f- became a college football fan over anything else besides, you know, I, I love the pageantry. I love the traditions, the history, but I love seeing the variance on, on offenses and defenses. And look, the last time we saw a power five team, uh, run variances of the option. Georgia Tech won two Orange Bowls with Paul Johnson and Nebraska won many national championships. They never needed to go away from it. Unfortunately, uh, they did. And, you know, hopefully hopefully we come to our our senses as, as a society and bring this thing back because I think it's a strong element of football. And as Mike Leach always said, they are selling college football and, you know, college basketball and college baseball. There is a reason that the college world series and the NCAA tournament are the two greatest happenings in sports. It's because they have a large field and we can see all the stories that people love with college sports play out. And it it goes to the point that you always say that we're starting to think of college football way more like the NFL than we are college sports. And, you know, it it is a money, everything's a money grab where whoever's making these decisions, man, decided a while ago that some dude slinging the ball all over the field is better for Ray. When that guy drew Brees, maybe. When that guy plays for the worst team in the FBS and they're insisting on doing it, it's not a good thing. And it's so short-sighted because they are selling it what college sports could be short. And, um, you know, I've been a big supporter of the idea of the uh, Northern Kentucky Norse getting a football program and going into the FCS and everybody who's an alumni of that school that I've brought that up to is like, I just don't know if they can afford it. It'd be a big thing. It's like, dude, you're, you're wrong about that. All these, the, the new buildings that you get for schools and the, the libraries, the technology and computers and resources, all of that comes from donor money from alumni and from revenue that you're able to bring in and football is a big part of that and i think nku you know just as a side note really satisfies a niche market south of cincinnati uh that which has a, a you know a dedicated if not over enthusiastic high school football fan base um but you get the the leftovers really from ohio and from cincinnati you easily could and I think they're a marketable school, but this again goes to people don't understand that you have to invest and you have to believe in the fan bases. This could be such a bigger thing, a much bigger global thing, if they believed in each individual institution to be able to rise to that level. And if those institutions would invest and then all they need is the platform and the opportunity. A hundred percent. And, and, you know, I read a great article, I think on Clemson and Alabama now I get it. They're FBS schools, and but what football has done to their ecosystem, as far as uh, you know, not only the money they make with football, but I'm talking about the amount of people that want to go there. If you're good at football, more students want to go there. Um, that, that's a fact. I, I look. I was surprised when I read it too, because I was like, "Wait, I, wouldn't you just want your degree?" But no, there's actually a, this is actually a thing, and that increases your value. Football feeds the ecosystem for all your sports. And even on the FCS level, I believe it can work. And I even think some of the restrictions, you know, a lot of people have said, you know, we've seen a lot of football programs go by the wayside. I know Xavier, you're from, you know, just outside of Cincinnati. Xavier used to have one, I think in the 1970s, it it went under, but a lot of that had to do with title nine. And I'm not here to tell you title nine's bad. I'm just telling you that when you have a roster of, of, you know, 90 or 60 uh, scholarship people, depending if FCS, I think it's what 63. Um, then I understand the, 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 the problems with, with that, because then you have to create enough women's sports to balance the 63 scholarships or the 90 scholarships that you're doing for football. I understand that. But with the NIL era, 
And I do think we're headed to this adventure. It might be 10 years from now, it might be 20 years from now. I think you might see a lot of uh, college athletics being their athletic departments are uh, are employees. And if that happens, then Title IX goes wayside, and then your economics for football go down, believe it or not. And uh, but but regardless of that, I still believe there's if there if if I if I can watch North Dakota State do this or North Dakota, whatever, wherever, smallest populated states in America, then Northern Kentucky should be able to do this. And, and uh, yeah, I believe it will feed your ecosystem. If you do it right and you invest and you go in knowing and wanting to be as the best you can be at football, I think the benefits will come. And as someone who went to UK for – you know, undergrad four years and law school three years, I can definitely attest that people go to schools because they want to support a particular athletics team. Yeah, there are kids that grew up in Kentucky and dreamed their entire lives about riding on State Street after a Final Four win. And because those are great moments, that's what you go there for. Those are moments that I feel bad for people that, you know, there's a lot of people who did smarter things than I did for college and went to smaller schools and paid a lot less money, but they didn't get that. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. And, and look, I think part of it for me when I was at ECU, I, I didn't grow up an ECU fan, but that definitely changed my life as far as me rooting for the East Carolina pirates. Um, and I'll always root for them because, because of my experiences in Greenville. So I, I get it. And uh, you know, I, I, how are we doing on that? Do you think that is a possibility like the, that the football program could happen with Northern Kentucky? Cause uh Come on, they got that George Clooney money. That's the thing, is that I don't know how broad thinking that that their whole athletics department is. I, I think that they are really enjoying the ride of being recently in D1 and already being a Horizon League basketball powerhouse. And I think that, unfortunately, they will be happy with that for a really long time. Uh, but what I, my whole movement has kind of banked on is that I think that there are people out there that feel the way that I do is that if NKU had a football team, like I can personally attest, I'm watching their games and I'm attending games when I'm in the area. Uh, I, I can, I can tell you this as, as someone that lives in Los Angeles, that I will go out of my way to watch games and probably even visit the stadium. If they're in a good area, you know, they're in a good area for people to watch football. They're in a good area for acquiring slept on football talent. Uh, and, you know, between Kentucky and Cincinnati, I know that there are people that identify in between those areas. Uh, and, you know, for people who were alums of that school, you know, there's been, a, you know, NKU, I think, has been around since like the 60s or 70s. That is all of that time without a football history. And the moment that you start that program, that's going to be, you know, 60 years worth of alumnus who are reengaged on a different level. And and let me, and you, you brought up this point earlier. It is a brand new day and age before like take Xavier. Xavier had a football team, I think for like, I think 50 or 60 years, maybe even longer. Right. I think it went away in the 1970s, but they didn't have a TV outlet that would broadcast them. Now, whether it's Northern Kentucky, whether it's Kennesaw State, who just started their football program in the past decade, and now they're going to be in the FCS next year, you can build that not only with your alumni, even if your alumni is is through scattered throughout the world. Maybe you your some of your best college students are all around the world running businesses and doing whatever. Well, you have ESPN Plus, and to me, like, or and and I and I think that we're only going to see more platforms for this moving forward as technology continues to improve. So a lot of times I think you would have that disconnect of before, like, you know, take, I mean, there's been so many de college football programs that have gone the, by the wayside, but if we were to just use Xavier as the example, uh, you know, maybe their fan attendance was good. I actually believe it was because Ohio loves football and, uh, but they weren't getting TV money. Well, guess what? It's because back then in 1970, you had to be in Notre Dame, Ohio State, or Oklahoma or something to get on TV because there wasn't even ESPN then. Now there's ESPN and there's 5 million ESPNs. And uh, I, I think it's much easier for the fan to stay engaged. And I, I to me, I don't understand. I understand the original economics of it being challenging, but I, I think long-term, 
it, it is a smart investment and it's been proven to be a smart investment. I think by most FBS and FCS programs, um, I think, you know, I, like I grew up in the DC area, George Mason, one of the biggest schools, you know, I, what are you doing? How do you not have a football program? I, I've wondered that it doesn't make any sense to me. And, uh, you I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I I hope to see more programs come out of this, but at the same time, I also realize that, uh, uh, that, you know, less people are playing football, which is ridiculous in my opinion, but anyway, like, um, it's funny if George Mason started their football program, I might immediately rank them as third in the state of Virginia. Um, but you know, and so this is such a good time for, alternative sports and for smaller school college sports, which really, I think, you know, there's a good deal of overlap if you were to draw a Venn diagram of those two. And with social media, you know, take the XFL. I tweet something like, damn, good game from Cody Latimer. That guy might be the best tight end in the XFL. That guy and his wife are liking it and retweeting it. It's a much more accessible platform with social media. And through that, you know, I can connect with other people that do things like this, like uh, Anthony Miller of the XFL and USFL News Hub, like yourself. It, it It's a much more enga- fan engaging process. And so to that point, you know, what are some things that you think the XFL has done right this year and some things that they've done wrong? Because in the latter half, I thought that they focused way less on The Rock as a marketing thing and a little bit more on the individual player stories and, and you know, throwing their weight behind their best teams and best home environments. Well, yeah, I like the home environments. I think they got a gem in D.C. and St. Louis. Uh, I would still like to see them try to target more MLS stadiums as they're building this um, or, or college stadiums. I don't mean like Tennessee or Kentucky. I mean like Missouri state, something that fits 17,000 people, because I do think that makes it easier to buy in from TV. Cause that's another thing is funny is like your fans, you know what the common complaint with the NFL fans or, or whatever on people trying to watch spring football um, oh, there's no one in the stands. Well, I mean, f- first off, that happened to several NFL teams, several, uh, and some very recently. But, um, uh, yeah, I mean, that they got to play, in my opinion, like the XFL and the USFL should not try to be the NFL. They should try to be a successful pro football league, but not try to be the NFL because you're not getting Patrick Mahomes. You can create something. We've already, me and you have enjoyed this thing that they have. But I also think that sometimes they're trying to be too much like the NFL. And I would appreciate some more variance and and a little more fun uh, within the league. Like taking away the beer snake and stuff like that. I thought, you know, I know that came back, but there's all these rules. I'm like, let it go. Let it go. You're trying to gain fans right now. I'll be honest. I think they should offer free tickets for this whole championship game. If it was me, I would do that. Uh, it's a write-off for you as a company, and uh, you know, you're know you promoting your, your, your league, and you want that thing packed on TV. So I would be doing stuff like that. But overall, I mean, I'm happy to see these leagues. I was surprised they didn't promote the Rock more, which I'm okay with that, but... I'm surprised. I mean, they could have done a little bit better marketing, I thought, but I also think it's tough when they start. It is going up against March Madness. We saw their, their ratings suffer a little bit then. Um, I <laughs> Some of the rules, I'm not a big fan of uh, uh, Dean Blandino. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, I don't understand what he, you know, he, he's like, replay it, but don't replay it. You know, let's play it at real time. I don't zoom in on it. I don't want to see it zoomed in. I'm like, wait, that's the point of replay. So I've been perplexed on that. Uh, and he said that like seven or eight times in games where I'm just like, what? The, I thought the league was a little suspicious when they, when Luis Perez was balling out with the Vegas Vipers and they traded him to Arlington for a guy with one tackle on the season. That was a little strange to me, but I understand that they're trying to make it, it competitive, but I still think if you want fan buy-in, fan buy-in should be uh, thinking that their team is doing the best for them 
And I, I don't, I don't know that I can be convinced that the Vegas general manager would say, yes, let's trade our starting quarterback who just over 300 yards, three of the past four weeks, or I think it was no 200 yards, three of the past four weeks, which 200 yards in the XFL is actually really good. And for a line for a, a linebacker, who's got one tackle on the season. I don't believe that that would ever happen. And I don't understand why that would ever happen. Um, and then they got Vic Bolden and they got Kelly Bryant. And, you know, I think, the game's going to be fun because they strengthen that team. But I do worry about like, if you're a fan of Vegas, if I was a fan of Vegas, I'm like, I'd be like, Hey, what the hell's happening here? You know what I mean? Like, so I'm a little concerned there. That's that, cause that's a little bit too much power when you own every team and they're not privately owned. Are you really looking out for the best interests of every franchise? So I'm a bit concerned there, but I think we have a good start. We have a good start. I would like to see, and you know, I've lobbied this and I don't want to beat a dead horse. I'm not a fan of the XFL kickoff and I I feel like a lot of people are, but I'm okay watching changes and seeing changes. So like they tried to think of something different. I commend them for coming up with something very original, but I don't think it's good. And uh, I also think, you know, you can't have it both ways. It's funny. I feel like most people, say, well, that, that kickoff's fantastic. Well, first off, the USFL is four weeks into the season. They've had two kick returns for a touchdown. We only had one in the XFL. So, and they're in their Super Bowl, essentially their championship game. Uh, so it doesn't lead to more returns. But also, a lot of times they'll say, well, this is a safer thing. Well, w- you can't have it both ways. If you're saying it's safer than the NFL, the NFL is a touchback, right? And this is contact. Right now, I hate the NFLs. Don't get me wrong. Like ever since they moved the ball back and it's a touchback, I think the XFLs is better than the NFLs, but you cannot have it both ways as far as it is still context. So therefore it is not safer. And then uh, we have outlawed the crackback block. Essentially, when you're going like this, that you have to make sure, you, you know, your guys in front of you. Well, the kickoff is kind of designed where your whole offensive line or your blockers have to look back to see when your returner catches it, which then gives the kicking team the advantage of hitting them with them not looking. Where I find that to be a double standard. I find that to be a double standard of like, wait, you've told me this is not safe when we do it. When we do a reverse or an interception happens and you block the guy without looking, you know, the blind side block, but yet now we have a whole kickoff based off this. I find it, uh, you know, just pretty ridiculous. And, uh, you know, I, I thought the USFL moving the yards back, the back, uh, back to the, I think they kick off now from the 20. Um, and you have a lot more returns because that's, that's really my favorite thing about it is we want to see these great athletes return. And I don't believe the numbers that more player people get injured on special teams. But even if that was the case, even if you could present those numbers to me, well, <laughs> welcome to life. Welcome to life. There's a risk in everything we do, right? I understand we want to make it the safest possible, but we want to make it the safest possible without changing the game that we love. And we have, uh, I think, forgotten that. So seeing to me in the USFL, these big time kick returns, I think are awesome. And I remember as a kid, you know, watching whether it was Eric Metcalf or Clarence Verdan or, you know, and the the kickoff was such an exciting play. And I, to me, the NFL completely has gone away with it. And the XFL's one doesn't really translate to me. The XFL one's kind of like a three yard run. That's what it is to me. Uh, I want to see these super athletes have a shot to take it a hundred yards or 90 yards every single week, every single time they touch the ball. So I think Mike Pereira got it right there. And I thought the XFL got it wrong there, but love the DC crowd. Love. Uh, I, I like some of the other innovation. I, I like the, you know, I, I I'm open minded to the to the two point conversion. I think that could be interesting. Um I think that's some of the good things. I'm still kind of on the fence about the fourth and fifteen. I think if I had to if I had to make a pick, I'd probably go against that personally. But I'm 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 trying to give it a chance. It's like, you know, I try to give it a chance whether you're watching CFL or Arena or or whatever. I try to think of okay, well, how does innovation happen, you know, in these leagues? I remember watching football when there was no two-point conversion. I think that was a great decision 
to go to a two point conversion. So you got to test these out somewhere. So I understand that, but uh, yeah, overall it's still a good season though. And I'm still optimistic about the future for, for both leagues. And uh, I hope that answers your question. Uh, and you know the Blandino thing it's funny because I'm like every time I'm like who's asking for more of this guy who is sitting there at home watching the XFL and going boy I wish I had Dean Blandino to fumble through this explanation and they're protecting him like they're so protective and sensitive when it comes to that guy but it's like dude why are you so convinced that this guy is your golden ticket nobody cares and he doesn't, he was never a ref. I, I, and I think it's bad marketing too. Like you cannot say seven, like there's been seven or eight different replays where he said, Nope, let's not zoom in. I want to see it in real time. And I'm like, what? I'm like, then why are we even watching you? You know what I mean? Like the if that's the case, right. yes, that's what I'm saying. Like, if that's the case, then let's not review it at all. If you need to see it in real time, well, we just saw it in real time. <laughs> you know what I mean? So therefore, you're completely useless then in this in this, you know, formula for us trying to watch football. And uh he's he's repeat I I'm almost like at a loss for words because I, I would have assumed, okay, one time that happens. I'll even give him the benefit of the doubt two times that happens, but then I would have assumed that the XFL would have held a meeting and said, Hey, Dean. You can't say that on air. We cannot say that. We need to, 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 you're there to get the call right. And if you got to slow it down, I don't care if you got to go to every little, you know, pixel and go slow, you know, as, as possible. You're there for that. That's the whole point of replay. If not, we don't need it. The game will go faster and, you know, we'll be happier. <laughs> I don't understand. We, I, I, it's it's mind numbing to me, and I, another thing is like he does he doesn't even have a refereeing background, so I'm even more c confused. You know what I mean? So it's like I don't know. I I, I think they could certainly get but improve there, in my opinion. And you know, safety is always a money grab too. You know, if it was popular with the masses to have a more dangerous, bloody, concussive game, they'd do it. The only reason that they go for safety is because that's how they're trying to appeal to the public. Uh, you know, so I, I, and maybe that is a bit pessimistic of me, but anytime I see a professional sports league or anybody say, we want to prioritize safety, it's like, you want to cover your ass is what you want to do. And you want to make sure that you don't lose fringe fans. And, you know, one thing that I think, and I think that the trend in the XFL ratings and what we're seeing with the USFL ratings so far this year is I think the XFL has benefited from, if you go to ESPN plus the app you will be able to find the game. But when the USFL is putting some of its premier games on the USA network, I, I think that that's, you know, where they look. I think you really benefit from a centralized location, even if it's not one of the major networks. And if you're able to throw more promotion behind it, like Fox uh, was able to, but that's another thing is that I think the XFL, I was told by Anthony Miller uh, that I met of the XFL and USFL news hubs that their marketing budget this year like promotion was $200,000, which doesn't make any sense to me at all. And it's like, dude, if you're in Orlando, if you're in Orlando, if you're in Arlington or Seattle, there should be a free t-shirt and XFL team sticker giveaway at every elementary school every week. There should be free posters at every grocery store in the area that people are taking home. And I just attended the double header for the USFL in Canton this past week. Uh, and it was $10 a pop, which is also where they're beating the XFL is in ticket prices because minor league sports and alternative sports are supposed to be affordable options so that people don't have to give in to the ridiculous money scrounging that's going on at the highest levels of professional sports. And immediately they give you a free USFL towel with the Maulers and Generals logo on it. And this sick shirt that I'm wearing right now, a red USFL t-shirt. If I got that for $15 on the internet, I would have called it a good deal. And so I definitely think that the USFL, you know, both through their history and having a playbook of success, uh, I think that, you know, they, they have a, a much better foundation. And so, you know, where they're struggling is that, you know, they're on four different channels. And right now, just like the XFL, they're kind of struggling to figure out who they're, the teams that they should put their weight behind this year are, except for New Orleans. I think they figured that out. 
Yeah, yeah, uh, but I, I agree with you. I think they have it more figured out. And you make a good point. One of the things I love about ESPN Plus, whether, you know, for me that, yeah, I, I preview every college football team and sometimes, you know, you let five or six months go and I'm in college basketball mode and then the offseason comes and I'm about to prep for Navy or whoever, Sacramento State, is that most of them are on ESPN Plus. You can go watch them. They're on demand. That is that is an advantage. Uh, however, um, you know, the, the XFL was playing some games on FX, which I know friends of mine that didn't even have that network. So they would have had to go to ESPN plus, uh, to, to go there. And that, you know, depending on the household you live in, that might be a process, but I feel like that wave is kind of dying off and I feel like everyone should be able to get to ESPN plus now. Um, but yes, I agree. The USFL I think is better ran. They also have more money to, to do that. So maybe that's a little bit of the, uh, the reasoning, but I think I I'd like what they're doing. I'm hoping that next year they go to home markets. That's the one thing to me that's holding it back a little bit. And I love the games in can, by the way, but um, I think they got something good. And I think the way that they're running it, I think Mike Pereira is a better uh, official. I think having the teams and the history behind it, I think is cool. I like the rules better, and I actually believe the quality of play is better. Now, some of that is because they've had a year at, that be, they beat the XFL to the punch, and I think that helps because continuity and building, like, I, dude, there's I live in Los Angeles. There's actually a bar. A bar, you know how like if you go wherever, like I've been down to San Diego, or I've been to to Cancun, where there's a LSU bar. You see the LSU flag, LSU Tigers, whatever, right? And, uh, you know, been in San Diego, there's a Virginia Tech bar. And uh, there's a, a spot in the Valley of Los Angeles that is a Birmingham Stallions bar. I think just building that, building that where they know Alex Mago, Skip Holtz, uh, Jamar Smith, Bo Scarborough, and, and having that familiarity is huge. That's how fandom starts. That's how fandom starts. You know what I mean? So that's been the biggest struggle of these spring leagues that have been failing or in year one where people like to ridicule them is there's no identity yet. And I think that calms with years. You have to be prepared to lose money for, for a few years or, you know, in USFL's case, they're owned by Fox. So I don't even think they're, they're technically losing money. Um, and maybe we see more networks start spring leagues. I don't know, but, uh, but I've been really pleased with the USFL. And they get it right with the fan ga- engagement too. Like you said, I have had multiple people tell me that. And, you know, quality wise, I agree. And, you know, it's, it's as simple as the difference between the Pittsburgh Maulers and the San Antonio Brahmas. You know, what it, they're very similar teams. What's the difference right now? And why do I feel confident that the Maulers right now can hang around to possible, you know, especially with the way the North Division shaking out, to a possible postseason bird like the Brahmas did? Is they've already gone to Troy Williams, who has made their who has made their offense night and day differences uh, since he's taken over that starting role. Um, yeah. Well, well, one of the things I think, and. I know that I'll probably sound like the the old man here, but I, the USFL, in my opinion, is better along the line of scrimmage. And I think that results in a cleaner game that you watch the XFL. Everyone was trying to pass the ball, even San Antonio. Like I felt like that that was a passing league with the exception of DC and well, DC's in the championship. Um, they passed. I, I actually had the numbers. I have them. I have a spreadsheet. I don't have in front of me right now, but I did the numbers on that. And the XFL, just wanted to pass the ball way more than the USFL. And for whatever reason, I don't know their reason. Maybe they think that's more marketable. Maybe that's just to fit their player personnel. I don't know. Um, But I can tell you that they stand out to me. Like when I watch a USFL game and it's not just me, I feel like the guys I host the podcast with USFL gambling podcast, XFL gambling podcast, the sports gambling podcast people in the studio that that I go to work with in in Los Angeles, we all say, man, the game is cleaner. The game is cleaner and it's a better product right now in the USFL. Maybe that's the year two thing. I don't know, but it is in my opinion, a much better product. I think that like there's more talent. It's just, it's just better. I don't know how to, I don't know how, uh, despite the empty stadiums, because obviously when you catch a game at Aldi field, with the DC defenders or the St. Louis Battlehawks, it's rocking and that's pretty awesome. But 
there's something about the product actually on the field that I think is a lot stronger in the USFL right now. All right, Colby. So while we while we got a few minutes left, uh, I just wanted to quickly touch on the subject of Kentucky basketball. Um, it's it's been a wild era for us, but it's like it's been less different for us. Like do, the. I remember the early days of Calipari being some of the most exciting times to watch sports in my life. When we went to four Final Fours in the span of six years and won that championship, you know, it, what we, the meshing of John Calipari and John Wall at the University of Kentucky changed college sports. Uh, in some way, it unlocked this idea that we had of what an, a college athlete's true marketing peak could be. And, you know, we've seen the evolution of that with guys like Zion. Uh, but I, I think that, you know, when John Wall did the John Wall dance at Big Blue Madness, college basketball was very different after that. And now, we, like Calipari can be sometimes, he's not an X's and O's coach. And he's been kind of slow to develop to this transfer portal era. But less than that, it's not that he doesn't bring in transfers. And I'm so sick of hearing about how good his recruiting classes are, man, because we talked about scouting uh, and we have recruiting talent every year. We Back to the 1960s, we've had good recruiting classes. That's never been our problem. But we always get shredded up by these little point guards, Marcus Noel and Kimba Walker and Shabazz Napier, Devin Downey, back to that John Wall year. And that's... That's it. We Calipari refuses to go, you know, to guys that aren't fo classic five stars. And I have a conspiracy theory about Reed Shepard making the McDonald's All American game. He that was a game that otherwise, without Calipari's influence, I don't think Reed Shepard would be a part of. And I think that he knows to to continue with at, at UK, he's going to have to play Reed Shepard when he's at Kentucky. And so he doesn't want to play a lesser known kid from Kentucky. He wants to play a kid that was in the McDonald's All American game. And it's this obsession with five stars that I think, you know, it's why we still put guys in the draft, but they're not getting drafted because what they did for the Kentucky Wildcats, they're getting drafted for what they did in high school. Yeah. And, and basketball, you know, I can, I can sense your pain, <laughs> but I, I also feel as a guy that covers college basketball, I know the transfer portal is crazy as shit. And maybe I would change some things about, where the players can transfer within, I, like, I think it's crazy. I think you should have to sit out one year if you're on your second transfer. Um, I just feel like that's fair because the thing, it, it is a little bit crazy, but I also enjoy the balance going on in the sport. Yeah. You, you have uh, these blue bloods like Kentucky. I think Duke was struggling. Coach K I thought was really struggling towards the end, getting a lot of one and dones and very reluctantly using the portal. And I I think there's something about continuity, especially in the game of basketball, um, where, you know, we've seen now all of a sudden a lot of teams kind of come out of nowhere because they can scout, and you don't necessarily need the five-star. Yes, you do in a way. Like, talent is talent, but at the same time, experience is huge. You make a good point on the the point guard play. I I tr I'm a firm believer that guard play, you know, regardless of the era, 70s, 80s, 90s, now, guard play travels in March, and that is important to, to me. And you see it. I feel like I mean Jimmy Laranagas, Miami squad made the Final Four. They started like I feel like their whole team was guards. Um, you know, I know you can use other examples and say, well, the year before the North Carolina had Baycott and, and Manic, but um, I, I do think that there's this uh, clear cut advantage right now for these coaches that can evaluate talent for their particular roster that is making college basketball very wide open. Yes, will Kansas and Kentucky and Duke still have an advantage as far as making the tournaments and having. NBA players on their team, probably more than most. Uh, yes, but I do think, and, and I, I can sense your frustration, and, and I would be frustrated too if I was a Kentucky Wildcat fan because you want championships. You know, yes, it's cool to have the NBA players, and I, you know, but at the same time, you want championships. And I don't know that John Calipari is the right man for that right now because he's bringing in a lot of talent, but he seems to struggle with continuity, finding that balance, 
for your team to be cohesive uh, and, and, you know, basically bringing in the right transfers. Uh, so I'm excited to see, I know that class, I know you mentioned Reed Shepard, but I, I, I'm, I'm, very excited to see that class. Our friend uh, Terrell Furman, who hosts the NBA Gambling Podcast, has been telling me uh, about a couple of these guys in the in, in, that Kentucky's landed uh, that are going to be complete studs. What is it? Whether J- Justin Edwards or uh, DJ Wagner or uh, Aaron Bradshaw, <laughs> um, those guys are all going to be studs. But we'll see if it works this in this day. And I think it will work good enough to go, you know, Sweet Sixteen probably. But I'm curious to see uh, because this model would work 15 years ago, but now the portal is so, uh, I mean, we've seen it in football and basketball really where freshmen don't really make a much, uh, that much of a big impact anymore. When you can get, when you can go out and get like the leading scorer for Arkansas state, who's like a fifth year senior. <laughs> I mean, that guy's like a 20, 24 year old compared to an 18 year old. Now, yes, Certain 18 year olds are talented enough to be better than the 24 year old, but at the same time, experience pays off. And uh, I, that's a perfect example. If you look at this past final four, every single team was, was, you know, super experienced. So um, I, I, I understand your frustrations and, and, and it'll be interesting to see, because I know it's, it's, he called out and said, we're a basketball school, but Mark Stoops <laughs> doing a great job football wise. I don't know that you want to be saying those things right now, but, I'm curious. I kind of thought the University of Texas would make a run at him, but Rodney Terry coached coached very well for them, and they decided to re up with him. But would you how would you how would you feel if they? Uh, I know his buyout is crazy, but how would you feel if say Cal? Let's say Dana Altman retires, and Phil Knight offers John Calipari a ton of money. How would you feel about him going and leaving? Curious. Here's the thing. I want to see, I think really this is the last year where it's like, let's see what you can do with this group because you've been talking about it for years. And so if you have another early tournament exit, uh, I think it says more about him than it does about anything else. And if you follow the timeline of the history of Kentucky basketball, it would actually be right in line. Um, Joe B. Hall, Rick Pitino, Tubby Smith all left after a very similar amount of time and a very similar championship and final four timeline. I think at Kentucky, just like with any major political position, which is essentially what it is, you you run a course. Uh, and I, I think that, you know, to think that that would never happen because of how exciting the John Calipari era has been for me. Um, I think that that would be incredibly short-sighted and ignoring a very long history that is there. And so Colby, I do have to get going now. Um, it's been, this has been, yeah, can I I say one thing? It also helps when Kenny Payne's only winning four games anyway, (laughs) continue. (laughs) No, and that's the thing. The Louisville rivalry is less fun now. I've never been less excited to beat Louisville. When it was Chris Mack and Rick Pitino, that was a blast. When it's Kenny Payne, a dude that was a friend, like of the program for so long, it it doesn't mean near as much. There was a time when that was the hottest ticket in sports. Oh, agreed. I would Going to those games, it was warfare, man. And now I, I don't care. I care more about a football win and watching uh, Satterfield look stupid as he didn't know that Will Levis had wheels. <laughs> I, I I would get before I would go out of my way. I still watch so much college basketball that I still note when Louisville is playing Kentucky. But before it was like, no matter what, I'm watching this game. It doesn't and- matter. I'm rearranging my whole day so I can watch this game. And I was at the game two years ago when Levis ran all over Louisville uh, and we blew them out in Louisville and watching that sea of red exit that game in the third quarter might've been the greatest feeling I've ever experienced. I'm excited actually for Brom against Stoops. I think this is, I think that's going to be fun. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So the football rivalry might be intense uh, intensifying, but the basketball rivalry, it's got a, it's got work to do (laughs) and it's not Kentucky's fault. (laughs) Well, so. Colby, this has been a super fun conversation. I hope we can do it again sometime. Thanks so much for being here. If there's anything that you want to say or anything you want to shout out, the floor is yours. Uh, please check out the Sports Gambling Podcast uh, in the Sports Gambling Podcast Network. I host the college basketball experience, the college football experience, and the college baseball experience. Uh, so check out that. Uh, also the USFL Gambling Podcast, the XFL Gambling Podcast. And I, and I appreciate you for having me on the show, man. It's fun to talk.
All right, folks, this has been another interlude episode of Roto Bowler's official MMA podcast. Tap that. We got more interlude episodes coming out. Check out my XFL, USFL gambling content. Follow me on Twitter at Roto Brady. Thanks for listening and peace.